It's great to have you all here, and uh, I think it's just past two o'clock, so we'll be able to start. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming to our third session of Crossing the Jordan. This is our final session, and we'll be looking at um, uh, a lot of uh, information about um, current world events and uh, focusing on the image of the beast uh, uh, crisis uh, that Revelation talks about. But um, yeah, just very glad you could be here. And we're going to start off with a word of prayer. So let's, uh, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just uh, want to come to you now, Lord, and uh, ask for your spirits to be here to guide us um, and guide me as I speak, Lord. Um, Lord, you put these things in Revelation for a reason. You put them in there so that we, we can know that um, when we're getting close to these things, we know that you're in control no matter what happens, Lord that you foretold these things will happen and you foretold that you're going to end it all and um, give us eternity, Lord. So, Lord, we just, we just uh, yeah, want to look to you today and just guide us as we look into these things. Um, we just pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, Sunday laws coming, ready or not. And uh, if you were there this morning, we looked at the climate change agenda and... Um, I hope you can see how it's trying to come through in the climate issue as, as well. <coughs> For those, James, this one here's not working. Are we able to chuck this one on? For those of you um, who um, might have missed this morning's session or the previous sessions, let's just recap ever so slightly. Previously, we discovered in the last days, say and will attack the commandments of God, especially the first four commandments. And this is what the final crisis is about, the attack on the commandments to do with worship. We learnt that in the last days, the Sabbath will be a big part of the final conflict and will trigger the mark of the beast crisis. And we learnt that <coughs> at this time, there will only be two groups that have formed. There's the remnant that receives the seal of God, which keep the true seventh-day Sabbath, which is God's test of allegiance we looked at. And then there's the majority who receive the mark of the beast. Um, we have to know um, that the mark of the beast is Sunday worship, and God's people will face a terrible time of trouble and persecution as Sunday laws are spread out across the world. And as we learned in the first session last week, God tells us that we must worship him on a specific day. And that day is the seventh day. Remember the Lord your God to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. God can't be any more specific on this issue. There is only one day in our week that God has sanctified and set apart as holy. And that day is the seventh day Sabbath, which is referred to as Saturday, especially in English, and also Sabbath in different languages around the world. Even in New Testament times, Jesus confirmed the sacredness of the Sabbath again and again. Jesus kept the seventh day Sabbath while he was here. So did his followers, his disciples, and the people who were associated with him. Even after Jesus had left in the book of Acts, um, we see the followers in the early church there keeping the seventh day Sabbath. The Sabbath is a big thing in the book of Acts. And it is clear, and if this is not clear enough, then we have Paul's writings um, which confirm the Sabbath. Paul says in Hebrews 4, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. He concludes, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish. Paul says that the weekly Sabbath is also a beacon um, for the future Sabbath rest to come, when Jesus takes us into the glorious heavenly rest promised lands and um, we see we see he makes it clear this is a life or death issue and um, it says let us therefore make every effort to enter will perish I'm not going to get very far of our PowerPoint today <laughs> so we might just wait to see 
how we go. We'll just, I'm, I'm not going to get very far without showing you some of these things, so I'll just wait to see if we get our PowerPoint back on, okay? Does anyone have any questions while we, while we wait for that? Yeah, Tracy. So um, the, the thing is, what we're looking at is not actually just going to be that everything will shut down. No. Yeah. But it's not going to go just bang, the government's going to announce you can't, you have to keep Sunday rest. It's going to get incrementally. It's going to be step by step, stage by stage. And we're told under inspiration that to begin with, it will just be encouraged and then it will get stricter and stricter and stricter. Ellen White mentions about this and she says in the early, in the early stages of it, um, we are to do missionary work on Sundays and to not arouse the attention of the authorities. Okay, that's what she says. You, you can look that up. But it's, it's going to be a soft one, but it is, it is what Revelation calls the abomination of desolation. As soon as you see the Sunday issue being talked about in the United States, in the land beast, in the government, that is the sign to flee. That is the sign. Um, okay, let's, let's continue on. Thanks. Thanks, James. If you can't get the screen working, James, that's fine. I can just look behind me. Um, okay, life or death issue. So we will explore, we've explored the climate issue this morning. Then this afternoon, we're looking at the second big avenue of Sunday laws, which is apostate Protestantism. And uh, this, is, this is what Revelation um, talks about, is in the context primarily of the land beast, the United States. And it's also worth noting, as you read Revelation, it also, it also refers to apostate Protestantism as the false prophets. Have you read about the false prophet in Revelation? It's the same thing, okay? This, the false prophet is apostate Protestantism. And today, we're worshipping here, this, we're in the Protestant church, you might realise. This Seventh-day Adventist is a Protestant church um, because Protestants um, are named so after and, and have come out of, I guess, the Catholic Church during what um, which was a protest against the Catholic Church over what they did and many of the teachings that they, they, they teach, which are not biblical. And uh, throughout history and even today, most Protestant churches um, worship God on a Sunday, which is the Catholic Sabbath. They call it the Catholic Sabbath. We read that this morning. And over the years... The Catholic Church has given Protestants a lot of slack over this issue. They ask, why are Protestants continuing to worship on the Catholic Sunday rather than the biblical Sabbath? And they don't hide these criticisms. So I'm going to share some of these with you. Okay? Um, they, write, they write this. The Sabbath was Saturday. Oh, by the way, this is, this is the catechism. Okay? This is their official doctrine of the Catholic Church. Okay? The Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. The church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Protestants must be rather puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said, keep holy the Sabbath day. The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible. So without knowing it, they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. What do you think of that? That's what they say, and it's, it's their Sabbath. They, they, they wonder, but this is not a standalone statement. We'll read another one. The Catholic Mirror. Reason and sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping holy 
of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. Okay, this is their words, not mine. Let's read more of their stuff. Protestants accept Sunday rather than Saturday as the day for public worship after the Catholic Church made the change. But the Protestant mind does not seem to realise that in observing Sunday, they are accepting the authority of the spokesman for the church, the Pope. It's a mark of their authority. We looked at that last session. This is what they say. This is what they teach. They're very clear on this. Okay, let's read this priest. It is well to remind the Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, and all the other Christians that the Bible does not support them anywhere in their observance of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church, and those who observe the day observe a commandment of the Catholic Church. Just keep going. This is a good one. The, the Roman Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. That's not found in the Bible. The Protestant claiming the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. What do you think of that? That's what they say. They have no warrant for observing Sunday. It's amazing. I can't disagree with them, can you, <laughs> on this point? Um, they claim to have made the change to, to Sunday, which they did, and they openly outright to say that there's no biblical authority for them doing the change other than whatever. Yeah. So, and they, they admit there's no record in the Bible because there isn't. There's no record. And as we looked at in our previous session, they said Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and the transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. This is the big, big issue. This is their defining mark. This is the mark of the beast. I hope you can see. And this is why they're so puzzled by Protestants who continue to follow this Catholic doctrine. But the Bible tells us all this will take place. So let's keep reading Revelation 13. And now let's go into what it says about the United States and the apostate Protestants. Revelation 13. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, talking about the United States. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Catholic Church, in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. There's a lot in, this, in these verses that we don't have time to go into today. This can be many, many studies, okay? But also remember, a lot that is mentioned here is in the future, okay? It hasn't happened yet. But it's talking about that final great crisis and the part that the United States will play in it, a big, big part. So in order to understand what God is saying here, I'm going to give you, I'm going to keep giving you some more meanings to the symbols that we have here. Earlier this morning, we identified the sea beast, the first beast, as the Roman papal system. We identified the land beast, as the, who's the second beast, the United States. Okay. Then we read in Revelation 13 just there about the image of the beast. Okay, what is the image of the beast? The image of the beast is apostate Protestantism. And as my favourite Bible commentator says, she says this, the image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will be developed when the Protestant churches 
shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. The image of the beast will be developed when the Protestant churches shall, shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. So the image of the beast is apostate Protestantism, which will use the civil government to enforce their teachings. As we've discovered from the previous sessions, the mark of the beast is Sunday worship, while the seal of God is the seventh day Sabbath. That's all the symbols that we'll need for today. Okay? The seal of God is the seventh day Sabbath. We looked at this in the first session last week. We are told this very clearly. Testimonies for the church. The sign or seal of God is revealed in the observance of the seventh day Sabbath, the Lord's memorial of creation. The mark of the beast is the opposite of this, the observance of the first day of the week. And in recent times, we are seeing the Catholic Church outrightly calling for Sunday laws to be put in place by lawmakers. They're outright saying this. I'm not just talking about individuals in the church. I'm talking from the official doctrine of the church. Take, for example, the catechism of the Catholic Church. Okay? What is a catechism? It's, it's a work that summarises the Catholic Church's doctrine. This is their book of Catholic doctrines. Okay? This, is the, this is their authority that they go off. And what is their doctrine on this issue? What do they say in this? Well, let's just have a look and see what they write in it. Remember, this is their official doctrine. It says there on the front cover that it is. So let's read it. In the 1985 version, it said, cooperation by the civil authorities regarding this commandment, talking about the Sabbath. It says, the civil authorities should be urged to cooperate with the church in maintaining and strengthening this public worship of God and to support with their own authority and regulations set down by the church's pastors. For it is only in this way that the faithful will understand why it is Sunday and not the Sabbath day that we now keep holy. It is only by civil governments getting involved, they say. Now, this is the 1985 version. Just for comparison, I'm going to show you the more recent version, what they say. And the more recent version takes things to a whole new level. Okay? This is the 1994 version. Ratzinger put this together. Pope Benedict, in other words. He was behind this revised version, 1994. This is what it says in section 2187. Sanctifying Sundays and holy days requires a common effort. In spite of economic constraints, public authorities should ensure citizens a time intended for rest and divine worship. Now, is this prophetic or what? I just want to show you where it's heading. And um, this next section, I wonder what you think of this next section, they say. This is section 2187. Next section, 2188, says, In respecting religious liberty and the common good for all, Christians should seek recognitions of Sundays and the church's holy days as legal holidays. Now, is that a Sunday law or is that a Sunday law? And, and notice religious liberty, for the sake of religious liberty. I don't, I don't know what that's got to do with religious liberty, actually. Um, and this, this final statement should really wake us all up, shouldn't it? Christians should seek recognitions of Sundays and the church's holidays as legal holidays. Now tell me, how do you make a legal holiday, especially in the United States? You, you have to go through Congress. You have to go through Congress. So, in other words, this statement, in their, this is from their catechism. This statement says that Christians should encourage or pressure the civil authorities to make Sunday a legal holiday. And how do you do that? You pass a Sunday law. Are Catholics calling for Sunday laws? They are. This is their official doctrine. But remember, the mark of the beast will not be formed until Protestants join this bandwagon. The Catholics have been doing it for a long time. You can see the years on here. 
They've been trying to do this for a while, but their wound has not healed completely yet. But as we read earlier, the image of the beast will be formed when the Protestants, um, when the Protestants pressure and use civil government to um, enforce these dogmas. That's why it's called an image to the beast. It is an image or copy of the Catholic Church, Catholic doctrine. The Catholic Church is already calling for this. They've been calling this for many years. So the question I want to ask today is this big one. Is an image of the beast beginning to be formed today? Is it beginning to be formed? In other words, are Protestants beginning to call on the civil government to enforce their teachings? And remember, the Bible tells us that we specifically need to look at the land beast, the United States, on this issue, as this is where the image of the beast will be formed. So we need to watch the United States very, very closely. But you might be wondering, how can all this possibly happen in America? Doesn't their constitution protect freedom of religion and the separation of church and states? That's in their constitution. Australia doesn't have those safeguards. So if this tried to come here, it could easily come through. But in America, they've got these safeguards. Here it is. The First Amendment of the US Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Okay? It's in their Constitution. This is it. So how, how is this going to happen? Well, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the news and affairs of the last few years in the United States, or particularly in the last few months, but if you have, you would be seeing that this First Amendment is under attack. What do I mean? Have you heard of Christian nationalism? Have you heard of that term before? What is Christian nationalism? Well, one definition says Christian nationalism is the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity. This is an American situation, this term. And that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Particularly, Christian nationalists assert that America is and must remain a Christian nation, Christian nationalism. Not merely an observation of American history, but as a prescriptive program for what America must continue to be in the future. Okay? And since this article was released in 2021, there has been a rise in Christian nationalists in America who believe the government must be directed by the church. Here's one such example. The pastor says Christians must be the ones writing the laws. We want God to be in control of everything the pastor said. Um, and uh, it's very interesting what they say. Um, it says here, he made a direct call for Christian nationalism, declaring that America should be governed according to biblical law for the benefit of believers and as a way to prepare for what? The second coming of Christ. It's all part of the king coming back. This was... April last year as a lead into President Trump's campaign. Can you see what they're calling for? And up until very recently, there was just a lot of voice behind this, a lot of pastors, a lot of Christian leaders who were Christian nationalists. And I could show you countless articles like this. But in recent times and within the last year, we, as we head closer and closer to the US election, we have begun to see powerful politicians, lawmakers and organisations call for church and state to combine back together to fix the declining morals and the state of the world. Here's an example of an um, organisation that has been raised up. Centre for Renewing America. Join the movement for God, for country, for community. Our mission is to renew a consensus of America as a nation under God with unique interests worthy of defending that flow from its people, institutions and history where individuals' enjoyment of freedom is 
predicted on just laws and healthy communities. You can see how this voice is getting louder and louder. And have you heard of the new speaker for Congress, the new speaker of the House of Representatives? Have you heard about him? He was elected just last October, last year. And um, here he is. This is um, Mike Johnson, is his name. He's a Christian nationalist. And he was elected to be the speaker of the House of Representatives, the top, top form of government in America. And here's a screenshot from my video on my YouTube channel that I put together. But just to give you an idea of how powerful this man is, let's just have a look at this. This is on the US website. This is the order of presidential succession. So if a president cannot carry out the duties of office, they have the second in line, the third in line, okay? Notice the first in line is the vice president. That makes sense. But who is the second in line? It's the Speaker of the House. It's Mike Johnson, okay? And let me, let me tell you, let me, let, let, let's let Mike tell you a bit about himself. Here's his X profile, Twitter X. Speaker Mike Johnson, he, he calls himself, he's the 56th Speaker of the House. He's a Christian, husband, dad, constitutional law attorney, and small biz owner. But did you notice that? What's his profession by trade? A constitutional lawyer. This man has actually served as a constitutional lawyer for decades. And as far as, as, far as experts in constitutional law go, this man might top them all. Yet, it's remarkable. We have an expert in constitutional law who's second in line for the presidency, and yet he is probably one of the vocal, one of the most vocal voices in calling for the unification of church and states. Here's one of his posts, okay, that he posted. He said, as we celebrate the second annual observance of Faith Month, this is a great time to explain the true meaning of the so-called separation of church and state. The so-called separation of church and state. Okay? This is just April last year this came out. Okay? Less than a year old. What, do you want to hear what his, what, what he, what his arguments are? Let's just, let's just read it, um, James, if we can put the sound up. Listen very carefully to what he says. There's a number of things that he says. Whenever I do these presentations, this stuff happens. <laughs> you, you'd be very surprised. Yep. Certainly there's a move to keep religion out of politics and, and to rigidly enforce the so-called separation of church and state. Indeed, this common misunderstanding about the separation concept is, is an important one. It's, it's one that's it's, uh, useful for us to address. In fact, it's one of my favorite uh, subjects. It's, it's a topic that I've debate, debated and, and written and taught university courses on for, the, for about 25 years, about a quarter century. I really believe this is among the most misunderstood subjects in our entire culture. See, most people today who insist upon a rigid separation of church and state are unaware that that phrase derives not from the Constitution itself, of course, but from a personal letter. But Jefferson clearly did not mean that metaphorical wall was to keep religion from influencing issues of civil government. Sir, do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic? I do, so help me God. Congratulations. You're going to see an aggressive schedule in the days and weeks ahead. You're going to see Congress working as hard as it's ever worked, and we are going to deliver for the American people.
Did you catch what his role was? He was sworn in to defend the Constitution of the United States. And that, and you've heard his views. Mike Johnson's Christian nationalist track record isn't a mystery, it's a tragedy. And just talks about how he's been working for, for years to try to erode the separation of church and state. This is his, as he said, one of his favourite topics, his passionate topics that he's about. And um, before you think he's lost the plot, he's actually got some pretty good reasoning behind him about this. Um, because you have to remember he's a constitutional lawyer, so he, he would have good arguments. So why is he trying to get rid of the separation of church and states? Well, he argues that the separation of church and state is technically not in the Constitution. In words, we read the amendment, it's not there technically. Okay? He argues the Constitution has been wrongly interpreted and that it was never intended that church and state should be separate. And he's certainly not the only member of Congress to think this. You can look at others, like um, Laura Bo Lauren Boebert. She, she calls separation of church and state junk and says church should direct the government. And she says, I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk. This is not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. Okay? The church is supposed to direct the government, and the government is not supposed to direct the church. She won her election last year. She's, people support her. Okay, But can you see where this is leading? Remember, this is what prophecy told us would happen. Is this prophecy being fulfilled? We read in the Great Controversy, such action would be directly contrary to the principles of this government, to the genius of its free institutions, to the direct and solemn avowals of the Declaration of Independence and to the Constitution. The founders of the nation wisely sought to guard against the employment of secular power on the part of the church with its inevitable results, intolerance and persecution. The Constitution provides that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof and that no religious test should ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. And she continues, only in flagrant violations of these safeguards to the nation's liberty can any religious observance be enforced by civil authority. But the inconsistency of such action is no greater than is represented in the symbol. It is a beast with lamb-like horns, in profession pure, gentle and harmless, that speaks as a dragon. Are we beginning to see the official leadership of the United States speak like a dragon? I think I've just shown you it. I believe we are. I believe these words are about to come true. Soon Sunday laws will be enforced and men in positions of trust will be embittered against the little handful of God's commandment-keeping people. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. And we're going to see that a bit la later on. They don't know where this is heading. They are working in blindness. They do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them a free, independent nation and through legislation brings into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusion, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages. Is the Sunday movement now making its way in darkness? Can we see Sunday laws developing in our social and political worlds? especially in the context of America. Have you heard of Project 2025? Project 2025. Now, this is, again, something that's only come up in the last year. Okay? What is Project 2025? Project 2025 is a plan to establish a framework for a hypothetical Republican winner of the 2024 United States presidential election. It's named Project 2025 because the president only gets into power in January of 2025, but the election is this year, okay? Project 2025. And you can just go to their websites, okay? Presidential Transition Project. Building now 
for a conservative victory through policy, personnel, and training. And so Project 25 itself is a playbook, and a manual, as they call it, for the next Republican president, whoever he or she may be, if they get elected to power, that is. And here's what the playbook looks like. It looks like this, mandates for leadership, this is the product of more than 400 scholars and policy experts um, and talks about how this is prepared by and for conservatives who will be ready on day one of the next administration to save our country. This book is the, entire, is the work of the entire conservative movement. The next conservative president will enter office on January 20, 2025 with a simple choice, greatness or failure. Pro, uh, Project 2025, mandate for leadership. This is what they're going to give to the next president. This is what you need to do. And in this book, it's almost a thousand pages long. It covers all areas of, of government, all the departmental areas, okay? Every area and tells, and tells what their plans are. And Ben Carson, who was the Minister for Housing and Development, he wrote a chapter in this, okay? Ben Carson did. Um, I'm not going to talk about his chapter now because I don't have time. But it... It's, it's amazing. It talks about laws facilitating Sabbath laws, Sabbath worship. And guess what chapter it talks about that in? It talks about that in the Department of Labor and Related Agencies. Okay? And this is what they write in chapter, oh, sorry, in page 589. Sabbath rest. What on earth is Sabbath rest doing in this document? Can you see that? Sabbath rest. You probably can't read that. I'm going to read it for you. It, they write, God ordained the Sabbath as a day of rest. And until very recently, the Judeo-Christian tradition sought to honour that mandate by moral and legal rec regulation of work on that day. Talking about blue laws. Moreover, a shared day off makes it possible for families and communities to enjoy time off together rather than as a Thomas-sized individuals and provides a healthier cadence of life for everyone. Unfortunately, this communal day of rest has eroded under the pressures of consumerism and secularism, especially for low-income workers. And then what's the action they want to do? Congress should encourage communal rest. Who? Congress. We've talked about how powerful is the top tier of government. Congress should encourage communal rest by amending the Fair Labor Standards Act. Okay? That, that day would default to Sunday. <laughs> that day would default to Sunday, except for employers with sincere religious observance of a Sabbath at a different time, e.g. Friday, Sunday, or Saturday sundown. Then the obligation would transfer that period in, instead. There's exceptions, but their default is Sunday. But if you remember COVID, how long did exceptions last for? <laughs> not, not very long at all. Their default is Sunday. In other words, Congress, they're asking Congress to make laws to facilitate Sabbath keeping on Sunday. That's, that's the, one of the commandments of God. They're trying to enforce one of the commandments of God, the fourth commandment, the one that God says we need to remember. Now, remember, they claim this document is the entire work of the movement. This whole movement wants this. Okay, They've all agreed upon this. It seems many in our world have forgotten how to rest, and, and they're wanting to, to bring back the Sabbath. Now, is this a good thing? Is this a good thing that they want to do this, to bring back a Sabbath rest for everyone? Well, at first glance, to everyday people, sounds great. A day off, a day of rest, a day of rest for families, for yourselves, for the sake of the environment. The benefits are endless. But do you notice what they say? Sunday is the default. Sunday was never sanctified by God, as we've looked at in previous sessions. God only sanctified the seventh day. He always, it always has been the Sabbath and always will be the Sabbath. And God told us not to forget that, and we did. So there's this, there's all, there's this here in, in here, but they go on. They go on. They, they don't just stop there. They go on. Then they have 
this underneath it, they have this alternative view. So this first bit we read, everyone agrees on that. They should, they should encourage, Congress should encourage communal rest. They all agree on that. But then there's an alternative view. Let's read what the alternative view is that some people are calling for. Urgent, more urgent action. While some conservatives believe that the government should encourage certain religious observance by making it more expensive for employers and consumers to not partake in those observances, other conservatives believe that the government's role is to protect the free exercise of religion by eliminating barriers as opposed to erecting them. They're saying, we don't want to charge employers for them to pay their workers more money on the Sabbath. We should have shutdowns on Sabbath with essential services only. That's what they're saying. Okay? This is, this is in, in their documents. This is what they're calling for. They agree it should default to Sunday. And then we have this alternative view. They're talking about a Sunday law. They're calling and pressuring for the civil government to bring the Sabbath issue before Congress if the Republicans get to power. They want Congress to pass Sabbath laws in clear violation of God's commandments. Now, why is this significant? Why is this alarming? Because Revelation tells us that if this happens, that is the formation of the image of the beast and will trigger the last final crisis that needs to happen before Jesus comes back. Because remember what the spirit of prophecy says the prophecy of revelation 13 declares that the power represented by the beast with them like horns shall cause the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the papacy this prophecy will be fulfilled when the united states shall enforce sunday observance which rome claims as a special acknowledgement of her supremacy we've read quotes from them about that Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favour, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Are we seeing this play out? Do you want to see, do you want to hear from the author of this chapter of Project 2025 and what he says about what he wrote about the Sabbath laws? He's, he was interviewed. And James, if we can chuck the sound on, here he is. His name is Jonathan Berry. He's authored this chapter. And this is the interview um, with him. Just got a little couple of minute snippets of what he says about his thoughts, about where this could go. Okay, listen carefully to what he says. Oh, wait, sorry. There he is. <laughs> so Jonathan Berry. One of the interesting proposals um, that, that you've laid out in, in Project 2025 handbook from heritage is uh, stuff around the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are some of the ideas that you have there? Yes. Um, so uh, this is, it sounds, it sounds controversial. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in many respects, it is, a, it is a return to something that basically always everyone ever had. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it, it's specifically the idea of um, encouraging Sabbath rest um, through discouraging commerce um, mm -hmm. on the, on the Sabbath, um, the 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 proposal that's in our book mm -hmm. is uh, amending the the basic federal overtime law, Fair Labor Standards mm -hmm. Act, to require that overtime be paid uh, for all work uh, done on the Sabbath. Um, oh, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I don't think um, uh, I, I don't think I don't think Congress has. Um, the authority to mandate like a national closing uh, mm -hmm. on on the Sabbath. This was that was always a a state decision mm -hmm. um, to do that. But I, let me add, it was always a state decision mm -hmm. to, to do that. They did, um, it. <laughs> and, and yeah, I'm not you know I'm not saying this practice was uniform, homogenous, uh, whatever, but um, very very widely spread, and only only recently in the last um, few decades um, have. Uh, have most states moved moved away from this? Um, so this is, um, I think, this is about as far as the federal government could could properly go mm -hmm. in this space. Um, but it would be an encouragement and inducement um, uh, to um, to to rest, but really to kind of coordinate commercial activity for the other six days mm -hmm. uh, of of the week, which mm -hmm. is as for 
as as long as we've had Sabbatarian uh, civilization, mm. you know, beginning like beginning in Israel and continuing into Christendom, mm. um, this is something that's been increasingly a part of the rhythm of civic life. Mm. Uh, most importantly, for people to have space to worship and honor God, um, and and secondly, to have times of communal rest uh, with their families and with their communities. Do you think in a in an America where family formation has plummeted, the commercialization of every part of life is 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 continuing and abundant, um, and religious observance is, is down. Yes. Do you think this would just result in like people getting paid more on Sunday, and but the, but it would look all the same? I so I think I think there would be some of that. Like I, I don't think this is a I don't think this is a panacea. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, but the law, like the law is a real teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this would, I think it would prompt as, as all laws do, um, meaningful repl reflection by, by serious numbers of people about, um, the importance of rest and what, what rest is for, uh, and, and separate and apart from, uh, its hortatory function, um, it's, it, it changes economic incentives. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think you would have a lot of employers who would be shifting work. Now, a lot of a lot of employers do a fair amount of this already because mm -hmm. a lot of people naturally disfavor um, Sabbath work mm -hmm. for whatever for whatever reason, and often command some kind of premium mm -hmm. um, to uh, to work on that. Are they talking about Sunday laws, Sabbath laws? Notice some of the words he said: inducements. Did you hear that word? We know that's got some prophetic implications. He doesn't know where this could go. He doesn't think Congress could do more in this space. But, he said, and as we read, the alternative view that they have is, um, yeah, they, the alternative view is they want a national closing on this day. So we need to remember that this Project 2025, this Christian nationalism movement, is from the Republican side, okay? So they're not in power at the moment in America. Um, the Democrats are in power at the moment. But it's going to make this year's election very interesting, okay? Remember what we read in the Great Controversy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the states will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Are we seeing the beginnings of this? What do you think? Are we coming up to the Jordan River for the second time? You know, just less than two weeks ago, on February the 22nd, maybe, maybe just over two weeks ago actually, this year, Donald Trump spoke at a National Religious Broadcasters annual convention. And I want you to look at this video now of what Donald Trump says, who's um, one of the Republican runners for the election. And remember, it's not about the party or the leader. I want to make that clear. I'm not saying the final crisis will come through the Republican Party. Because, in fact, this morning, the whole session this morning was probably from the Democrat Party, because they're pushing the climate issue. And they're pushing Sunday laws for a different reason. But, and, and they're aligning with the Pope, the Democrats, and they're calling for Sunday laws for the sake of the, the environments. But this afternoon, we're looking at the Republican side, okay? We need to look at the balanced view of this and see it's coming from all angles, this, okay? Let's hear what Donald Trump says just two weeks ago. Ladies and gentlemen, with your help and God's grace, the great revival of America begins on November 5th, 2024. We're able to do it because you're the people we want to hear from, the pastors and the ministers and the rabbis. The people in this room are the people we want to hear from, and they have to have a political voice. You know, if you think about it, you have men, you have women, and you have religion. If you look at it, you have more than the men, you have more than the women. You have such power, but you really, you weren't allowed to use that power. 
and you're now allowed to use it. I get in there, you're going to be using that power at a level that you've never used it before. It's going to bring back the churchgoer. I mean, you have to see. I don't like the charts when I see charts where they're going in the wrong direction. We don't like that. We're going to bring it back. And I really believe it's the biggest thing missing from this country. It's the biggest thing missing. We have to bring back our religion. We have to bring back Christianity in this country. He's going to give Christians power like they've never seen it before. I remember um, he said in his first um, term, leading up to his first term, he had the slogan, um, Make America Great Again. This time, what they're handing out, they're handing out stuff that says, Make America Pray Again. That was just two weeks ago, okay? Unprecedented political power he wants to give to Christians. And when did he say the great revival of America starts? November the 5th, 2024, the US election. And you know, just this year, 2024, even though we're just a few months in, in the media outlets, the media outlets have bombarded us with this Sunday Sabbath issue, okay? So many, so many articles have come out. We looked this morning at this article to do with climate change. They're calling for a universal period of rest from the Washington Post, January 23, 2024, okay? This is not the church, this is the Washington Post, capital of America, calling for it. We looked at this year, Feb 21, February 21, 2024, Eco Sabbath, how to cut emissions by doing nothing, okay? That's the climate stuff, okay? But there's more. This year, Time Magazine, on January the 25th, rest takes hard work. They talk about how weekly Sabbaths need to come back. They, the Puritans, had, uh, they, they recognised the value of rest and had famously strict work ethic, but they also took their Sundays very seriously. Okay? And I can keep going for this year. Um, the dying American rest ethic. Okay? Uh, this is from January the 7th this year. They quote the Sabbath commandment there in Exodus 20. And um, they say that during the, we have this, this raging epidemic of anxiety and assisted depression. We need a day of rest. It is sad that God had to legislate a day of rest for the Israelites, but he, he knows how we humans are. You are not a Jew. You live under the New Testament rather than covenants, but you need to see the wisdom in rest, okay? I bet you find it nearly impossible to take one day a week of complete rest. I bet if you're determined to do so, those around you would think you're becoming sick or lazy. No telling how long you might live or how healthy you could be if you observe the day of rest to the Lord's. This is in the context of America, okay? So is the land beast getting ready? It is, is the sea beast getting ready? They are, the sea beast is getting ready. We've We've looked at publications from the Catholic Church, and I'll show you some more now. The Catholic Church is getting ready for this. Check this one out. This is the Catholic Church in the European Union, okay? They have the European Sunday Alliance, they call it. Work, live, time together. And so this is 1st of March, 2024. How long ago was that? Nine days ago. European Sunday Alliance issues new manifesto promoting a work-free Sunday for all. Okay, have you heard of Brexit? They exited the European Alliance, but there's still lots of countries in it. And this is what they're calling for in the European Alliance. In view of the European Day for a work-free Sunday, 3rd of March, the European Sunday Alliance issues this um, a new manifesto stressing that synchronised resting time is an effective tool to counter loneliness and highlights its importance for the mental health of workers. Okay? And um, they, they write a lot more in this. We're not going to read all of it. But they list all the MPs of the Union and all the countries. Slovakia, Germany, Czech Republic... Um, Austria, Romania, Italy, they list all the people that are promoting this, okay, that are calling for this. And um, they say, how prophetic is this? 
The Alliance is a broad network of more than 100 national Sunday alliances, trade unions, employers and organisations, civil society associations, um, churches, committed to raise awareness about the unique value of Sunday for our society and the importance of a common day of rest. It's all there. Is the world preparing for this? Is the last days just before us? Okay? The Catholic Church is really trying to push this issue and trying to push this particularly um, to the world. Here's another example um, on the US Catholic websites. Okay? This time we're focusing on the US here. This is published February the 2nd, 2024, just a month ago. A new documentary makes a case for reviving the Sabbath. Sabbath is a spiritual discipline. Should it also be social policy? <laughs> I, I just I, I haven't got time to present you all this stuff, but this is, this is out there. It's all out there. It's all coming out. It's okay. Let's go another one. Remember when every Sunday was family day? Do you remember when every Sunday was family day? And they, they talk about slowing down and all this stuff. It's just amazing. It's, it's all there, okay? And interesting enough, someone must have given the Catholic Church or one of their, one of their headquarters a great controversy because the Catholic Church actually released, um, again, just this year, an, an article entitled The Sabbath or the Lord's Day. And they actually quote the great controversy in it and they actually um, actually um, share and try to defend their position. It's absolutely remarkable. This is the Catholic News Agency, January the 30th, 2024. Recently, we received an 80-page booklet entitled What's Behind the New World Order, which was originally published 100 years ago under the title of The Great Controversy. This book was written by E.G. White, foundress of the Seventh-day Adventists, it claims the Catholic Church is behind the New World Order. The booklet claims that this is true since the Church is the beast of Revelation. It accuses the Church of many evil things, uh, Mark of the Beast, Day of the Sun. Now, it is true that the Old Testament says the seventh day is the Sabbath, but assigning that to Saturday is Hebrew tradition. As Christians, we must consider this in light of the New Testament and the teachings of Christ. If this is a Mark of the Beast, Almost all Christian churches today bear the mark too. <laughs> okay? But then they continue. Read this. It is true that the Catholic Church, through the authority of Christ, replaced the Hebrew Sabbath with the Lord's Day. I showed you stuff from 50 years, 100 years ago. This is from a month ago. It is true that the Catholic Church, they're still claiming it. They're so prideful about it, okay? This, they haven't changed their tune. They've replaced the Hebrew Sabbath Saturday with the Lord's Day Sunday. However, this occurred, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> God in his wisdom knows that we need to set one day a week special to him. Otherwise, we will become so busy with our daily work that we may forget about him and lose our faith. Now, the essential point of the third commandment is that we set it one day a week holy to the Lord's. What's wrong with that sentence? It's the wrong commandments. If you're not aware, they've actually changed the commandments. And they've, they, they've changed, they've taken out the idolatry commandment, I think. And they've, because they, they practice idolatry. And, and um, they have called the Sabbath the Lord's Day in their commandments and bumped it up to number three. And then they've divided the last commandment into two. Anyway, <laughs> Observance of the Lord's Day is not a mark of the beast, but being the mark of a Christian. What do you think? I just want to remind you, we've been here before. Remember, we've shared that in 1888, Senator Blair put to Congress a bill to secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as a day of rest and to promote its observance as a day of religious worship. But are we coming back? to the Jordan River for a second time. There was a delay, but are we coming back? Check out what this Christian nationalist has to say in this video. Thank you, James. 
So civil law is, is just something that, the, that we're, we're basically um, com ordered to do by the magistrate uh, for our good. Uh, and so this is everything from you know, tr speed limits, uh, and I think also Sabbath laws. But what we ought to do is what Adam ought to have done, which is to order this life to the next. So in, the, in, in uh, exercising dominion over the earth, we are not, nor, nor, was Adam, nor would Adam have done this, we are not bringing heavenly life to earth life. We're just maturing earthly life according to the human nature and the principles of, the, of this life. And so we have to do the same thing. But in doing so, we're not bringing heaven to earth. We're ordering this life to the next. So what does that look like? Well, that means, what, what, what are the things of the kingdom of God? What, what are the things of eternal life? Well, it's word and sacrament in the visible church um, or the instituted church. So how do you order people, uh, how do you order Christians uh, to eternal life? Well, you, in, in an outward way, you, uh, you do what you can so that they can worship God and worship God uh, and uh, the, the church can administer word and sacrament. Uh, and how, in particular, how would you do that? You'd have Sabbath laws, and Sabbath laws uh, are not to simply to punish violations of fourth commandment, but, they're provide the, to, but to provide the conditions in which people can worship God without distraction. That's the purpose. The purpose is not simply God says fourth commandment, that's bad, so therefore we punish. That's not what, what I'm saying. We do that because the fourth commandment is, is essentially saying that we ought to worship God corporately um, with, with his people um, on, a, on, on Sunday or, or special day. And so uh, the civil government is there. How, how, are you, how can the civil government in an outward sense contribute, order you to that? Like, like as I said, you re they removed the distractions of that day so that you can focus, in, focus on the worship of God. Remove the distractions of that day. The Great Controversy says, When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of Roman hierarchy and the affliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably inevitably results. Are we seeing the beginnings of this? The mark of the beast is to be presented in some shape to every institution and every individual. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. And in America, we can see the two big avenues of Sunday laws brewing. We've got the Democrats calling for urgent action on climate change and calling for rest for the sake of the environments. Then we've got the Republicans calling for the return of Christian principles and the unification of church and state. Sunday laws are being proposed in both camps. Where are we heading? Where is this coming to? Are we coming up to the Jordan River for a second time? There won't be a third time if you look in scripture. Remember what one of the spies said when they did come to the Jordan River? In Numbers 13, it says, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are, great, are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sights, and so we were in their sights. Likewise, we discovered that Bible prophecy tells us that there will be giants to face before we enter our heavenly promised lands. And the Bible describes that in the future, it will be a land that tries to devour its inhabitants. Our world is changing, and our world is going to change dramatically soon. Jesus says, then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Then we're going to get things to get a lot more supernatural. Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens in token of the power of miracle-working demons. 
The spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in deception and urge them on to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. By these agencies, rulers and subjects alike will be deceived. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to preach the gospel. We need to preach this message. We need to share this message far and wide. This is the three angels' message, is it not? This is there. This is, this is what we're told. That's what this church has been given at this time. That's what I'm trying to do. I remember what Jesus said. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. And with the advancements of technology, this is now happening at a tremendous rate. Okay? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Do you want to be in this camp of people? I sure do. And um, I just want to encourage you all as we keep going about in our lives to keep looking up to God's. Because even though these things that um, Revelation has said will come may seem scary and unsettling, we're also told that God will take care and look after us and shelter us through this. And Psalm 91 is also very relevant if you want to read that. It's about how God will protect his people during these times. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you for coming this afternoon and uh, coming on a 40 degree day to an afternoon program. You're very, very brave. I hope it's been comfortable for you. Before you leave, let's just have um, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we can see your signs unfolding at a tremendous rate. God, please help us to keep looking towards you in everything we do. Lord, please help us to be able to share this message, this urgent message. Please send your spirits upon us and this church, Lord. And Lord, please use us to send the warning to the world that your coming is very, very soon, Lord. And there is a great deception, but your calling for people to return to you and your truths from your words, Lord. We just thank you. We ask for travelling mercies now as we go home and in the heat, Lord. We just thank you for your Sabbath and we just uh, praise and glorify you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless you.